This video series will be examining the history of the conflicts that collectively came to be known as the Science Wars. The Science Wars were a series of intellectual exchanges on the topic of the nature and objectivity of science. The participants were extremely diverse in their academic backgrounds and included physicists, epistemologists, Afrocentric historians, cultural anthropologists, queer theorists, developmental geneticists, legal scholars, and many, many more. It is difficult to characterize the two sides of the debate in terms of the academic backgrounds of the participants, since key figures on both sides of the debate included scientists and humanists, though the relative proportions did differ significantly on both sides. Most broadly, the two sides of this debate can be fitted into the views they held about science, and it is for this reason, and not necessarily because of who participated and on what side, that the conflicts that arose were called the science wars. One side of the debate believed that scientific theories are ultimately value-free, that the conclusions drawn by scientists on a given matter are influenced not by their personal prejudices and politics, but through the consistent, painstaking analysis of data in accordance with the standards of the field. Though most members of this side, who will hereafter be referred to as scientific realists, did concede that political and sociological factors do come into play during the scientific activity, as they do with any other human endeavor, they maintained that the scientific process ultimately filters out such prejudices, that the regularities of nature do not obey human biases, and that myopic models of nature that fail to adequately capture its behavior will inevitably fail when put to the test. The other side of the debate believed that the scientific enterprise, as currently constituted, was developed by a culture with a history of injustice and prejudice toward most categories of people, and so the people who did the science carried their prejudice and biases with them into the laboratory. The resulting science was not so much an objective appraisal of nature and its behavior as it was a kind of official stamp of approval on a subliminal societal narrative. The critics from this side of the debate charged that the social function of science has been to legitimize the unjust rule of a white, straight, heterosexual, cisgender, bourgeois male elite. Like Whig history, which attempts to legitimize those in power by painting a historical narrative that favors the present socio-political state of affairs, Whig science sought to eliminate inequalities of outcome by claiming that they have a natural rather than institutional basis. This side of the debate, whose members will hereafter be referred to as the radical constructivists, believe that they have a moral imperative to alter the scientific enterprise, among other institutions, so as to allow the equally valid truths of marginalized peoples to be legitimized by the scientific meta-narrative in order to help socialize people in such a manner as to achieve a just and equal society. I hope to make it clear from the outset that I firmly align myself on the side of the scientific realists in opposition to the radical constructivists, whom I regard as dangerous adversaries of science, not in the least because of the institutional power that they hold in the one sector of society that should be decidedly against anti-science. In choosing to draw attention to the radical constructivists and highlighting the history of its development, as well as the objections that have been levied against it, it is my intention to help make people aware of the ideology that underlies much of contemporary scholarship, and to cultivate some healthy skepticism against the claims of those whose work has influenced some truly terrible policies in education, journalism, and even the justice system. These people do have an impact on society, and they are helping to cultivate a generation of leaders that are so incompetent and so simple-minded that even when they have a monopoly on cultural content, media influence, and academic backing, they still manage to lose political power to a man even more dense and narcissistic than they are, and whose policies, at least where science is concerned, will yield nothing but calamity and stupidity. Speaking of which, for those who object to my prioritization of the radical constructivists over the current administration when choosing who's anti-science to attack on the grounds that Trump is anti-science too, I'm afraid that I can't accept that criticism. Aside from the fact that it's a blatant tuquoque, the power that Trump wields is temporary and is regulated by a system that has resisted autocracy for two and a half centuries. We have had anti-science administrations before, and we have survived them. I won't pretend that there won't be serious consequences, and I'll be there every step of the way to challenge his policies, but as it currently stands, most people already know that Trump is more full of shit than the combined intestinal tract of the entire fat acceptance movement. What most people don't realize is that equally disingenuous and opportunistic sophists occupy an institution that should, under normal circumstances, be the most trusted and highly regarded aspect of a civilization. The fact of the matter is, Trump does not have tenure. They do, 
which means that they are going to continue doing damage long after Trump is gone. Let me help illustrate the seriousness of the situation by giving you a typical example of the sort of scholar that we'll be reviewing in this series. Sandra Harding is a professor and a researcher who has been working at UCLA for over 20 years. She first rose to international infamy among academics when she published her 1986 book, The Science Question in Feminism, where she helped develop the field of feminist epistemology, of which I'll have much more to say in the next video. In this book, she argues, among other things, that the metaphors used by the progenitors of modern science likened nature to a woman who was to be brutally interrogated and explored against her will. This attitude, she claims, has infected scientific inquiry from the outset, masculinizing the scientific activity, and framing it as a means for men to dominate Mother Nature. And so Harding suggests, in a quote that won her a special place in the heart of every physicist, that Newton's laws could just as easily be referred to as Newton's rape manual. Six years later, she was made a visiting professor at UCLA's Department of Women's Studies and Department of Philosophy. Four years after that, she was given tenure and expanded her professorship to the university's education department, where she trained future teachers over the course of 15 years. That same year that she had earned tenure, she was made the director for the Center of the Study of Women, whose research helped set the curricula for courses within a broad range of disciplines, as her work is highly interdisciplinary. Among the courses whose content she has influenced, as well as personally taught, Almost all of them fall under the umbrella of general education requirements at UCLA, which are necessary for all undergraduates to fulfill in order to graduate, regardless of their major. As I said, I'll be dealing with the content of the work that she and her peers have cranked out in the next video of this series, but I first want to take a moment to look over some of her research in order to assess its quality. One might expect that a leader in the epistemology of science would have at least a rudimentary understanding of science's history and operations, particularly if that person has been hired at UCLA. But as we are dealing with the radical constructivist, one would have to walk away deeply disappointed and disturbed. Again, the place where I'll be exhibiting and arguing against her epistemological framework will be in the next video. Here I intend only to show that the quality of her work is unacceptable, which I'll do by pointing out errors that are so elementary that even an undergraduate historian of science at a community college would be given a failing grade. In her 1991 book, Whose Science, Whose Knowledge, Harding put forward the argument that Rosalind Franklin, whose work allowed Watson and Crick to discover the structure of DNA, was denied the Nobel Prize because of androcentric bias. What Harding neglected to consider here is that Franklin died in 1958, and that the Nobel Prize, which is never awarded posthumously, was given to Watson and Crick in 1962. Speaking on the topic of evolutionary theory, Harding also claims that, and I quote directly, contrary to Darwinian and other interpretations of evolutionary theory, females too have evolved. Harding later goes on to argue that the social values of Weimar Germany influenced the development of the theory of relativity. However, given that the special and general theories of relativity were published in 1905 and 1916 respectively, and that the Weimar Republic didn't come into existence until 1919, it is doubtful that even Einstein could have pulled that off. She later claims that the Dogon people of West Africa had discovered, sometime between 1200 and 400 CE, that a small star, invisible to the naked eye, had an elliptical orbit around the star Sirius, and that they knew that it took 50 years for the star to complete each revolution. She offers no evidence to support this claim other than the testimony of European missionaries long after the alleged fact, nor does she explain how this discovery could have been made possible by a people who had lived hundreds of years before the development of reflective telescopes and the recorded discovery of the laws of planetary motion. Harding merely asserts that this supposedly African knowledge was hidden or ignored by Europeans due to their white supremacy, and she leaves it at that. Incidentally, this episode is frequently cited by conspiracy theorists as evidence that ancient aliens had planted the seeds of civilization. These are just some of the elementary errors made in only one of Harding's books, this one being published only one year after her being awarded the title of Woman Philosopher of the Year by the Eastern Division Society for Women in Philosophy, and one year prior to her appointment to one of the most prestigious universities in the world. Since then, the many honors and accolades that she has collected have included the American Education Research Association Award for Distinguished Contributions to Gender Equity in Education Research, and the John Desmond Bernal Prize, which is the most prestigious award offered by the Society for the Social Studies of Science. 
Now, Sandra Harding is just one person. In this series, I'm going to show you dozens like her, who far from being punished and blacklisted for their specious scholarship and destructive policies, which I'll also discuss in a future video, are instead given accolades and awards, honors and tenure. This is an institutional problem, and I'm going to address it. This series will discuss the history of the conflict between people like Harding and those who defended the integrity of science, braving unwarranted accusations of racism and sexism in order to show the world that the Emperor has no clothes. The series is going to be highly critical of such subjects as feminist epistemology, queer theory, and Afrocentric thought, as well as the high theory of French intellectuals from previous decades. These videos should not be taken as a polemic against women's rights, or against fair and peaceful coexistence between people of different ethnicities and skin colors, or against the rights and freedoms of LGBT individuals. I am sympathetic to all of these issues and have no desire to regress to the cruelties of a bygone era. The function of this series is to act as a critical historical examination of the development of radical constructivist thought as it pertains to science, the general themes underlying these theories, the gross academic malpractice of those who devised them, and the response that scientific realists made to the radical constructivists' bastardization of science. It is my hope that this account of how the radical constructivists attempted to vandalize scientific knowledge will empower those who are currently watching with dismay as the same theorists and their college-aged intellectual progeny continue to vandalize education, art, and journalism. It is my hope that after you finish watching these videos, you will become well equipped to criticize their underlying worldview whenever you see them try to vandalize culture and ostracize those who don't march to their tune. And in particular, I hope that college-aged viewers will walk away from these videos vigilant and intellectually armed against those unreflective and uncreative mobs of students who will uncritically embrace the radical doctrines of their constructivist professors. In closing, I'd like to acknowledge Indiana University's Department of History and Philosophy of Science Professor Emeritus, Dr. Noretta Koerch, for her decades-long investigation and exposure of these topics, and for her organization of collaborations between those scholars who have been my primary source of information on the science wars. I'd also like to acknowledge, in the same vein, University of Virginia's Professor Emeritus of Biology, Dr. Paul Gross, the late Professor Emeritus of Mathematics at Rutgers University, Dr. Norman Levitt, theoretical physicist and philosopher of science, Jean Bricmont, Theoretical physicist Steven Weinberg, whose titles and accolades, including a Nobel Prize, are too numerous to list even briefly. And of course, NYU professor of physics and mathematics, Alan Sokol, whose legendary hoax will get an episode all to itself in this series. These videos will be heavily referenced, and all citations that appear on the screen throughout this series will be found in the description boxes below. These boxes will also contain my own footnotes and written commentary, as well as revisions to any errors that I might make. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the scientists, philosophers, and academics on YouTube who have drawn my attention to the finer points on these matters, and whose views have been very helpful in orienting my own. The computer scientist Shinobi Yaka, the philosopher Zarathustra Serpent, the humanist scholar Academic Agent, the philosopher Gary Edwards, and the evolutionary psychologist Gad Saad, all have videos that go into tremendous detail and depth, and cover things much more thoroughly than I can with this surprisingly broad topic. I strongly recommend that you follow their channels and watch their thoughtful and insightful videos. Links to their channels will be down in the description box below. If you like this video, hit that like button in order to make the algorithms deliver it to more people. If you really liked it, go ahead and hit that favorite button, and share it on your social media platforms to make it spread even further. If you're not subscribed yet and want to keep up with my work, go ahead and do so, and be sure to hit that bell so that you get notifications whenever I release a new video. And finally, if you've got a few extra bucks and feel like sponsoring future content, pay a visit to my Patreon and I'll add your name to the end credits. Until next time, KC out.